Okay, our next uh, session is going to look at the significance of the South China Sea in, this, in the uh, changing regional landscape. We, the last panel looked at it from China, ASEAN, uh, uh, US point of view. This one's gonna take it out a little bit broader. We got uh, three uh, great panelists joining us here today. On my immediate right is Tetsuo Kotani. He's a research fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. On his right is uh, Amir Latif, who's a visiting fellow here in the uh, Wa 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 Wadwani. Wadwani, sorry, tongue twister, Wadwani chair in the US-India uh, Studies program here at CSIS. And then at the, uh, at the far end is uh, Ambassador Stapleton Roy. He's had various roles in the, uh, in, in the region, served as ambassador to China, Indonesia, and Singapore. So we'll go in the order where people are seated and um, look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I, uh, I just came uh, from Tokyo to Washington this morning and, and I skipped uh, most of the sessions today. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately I'm still, uh, I'm now suffering from jet lag so uh, to keep myself awake, I, I think I have to make some provocative uh, <laughs> remarks. But before that, I, I have to say uh, I'm here on my personal capacity, and I don't represent the Japanese government, foreign ministry, or my uh, own institution. Uh, uh, so let me clarify, first of all, the, the Japan's interest in the South China Sea. Uh, Needless to, needless to say, uh, Japan is not a claimant in the South China Sea. We actually gave up all the claims uh, after World War II. So we don't take any size on the territorial issues in the South China Sea. Uh, we don't intervene in any uh, territorial disputes among the claimants. So the primary interest for us is, the, of course, the freedom of navigation and the commerce. Almost 70% of Japanese trade, both imports and exports, pass through the South China Sea, and especially the 80% the of Japanese imported oil uh, needs to come from the Middle East through the South China Sea. So uh, as the trade route, the South China Sea is critical for Japan. Uh, Japan respects the sovereignty of coastal states and we also respect the sovereign rights in coastal states, EEZ. Uh, but we are very much interested in, and we are also very concerned about uh, our navigational rights in the South China Sea. For example, some countries say uh, the foreign warships cannot exercise military activities in EEZ and some country requires prior uh, notification or approval for the innocent passage. Um, this is uh, against Japanese interest and we cannot accept such a, uh, excessive claims from the coastal states. I actually uh, met uh, officials from the, the Vietnamese uh, embassy in Tokyo uh, before I left and they briefed me about the new maritime law of the Vietnam. And they say the Article 12, Paragraph 2 states the uh, foreign warships have to uh, make prior uh, notification on the passage through the Vietnamese territorial waters. And we cannot accept such a uh, law uh, because it's a uh, violation of innocent passage right. Um, and uh, uh, let me see. So um, I think we have to understand that the, uh, you know, the coastal countries are now uh, disputing over sovereignty in the South China Sea but at the same time, they are sharing the you know, interpretation of the law of the sea, which 
uh, restricts the freedom of navigation. So, uh, as I said, we don't take any size on the territorial disputes in the South China Sea, but we have to be worried about the, our uh, navigational rights. So, under such a uh, circumstance, uh, the Japanese, the primary uh, concern of the Japanese government is, you know, what's going to be, uh, what uh, will the code of conduct will look like? If any uh, uh, rule which, is, uh, which will restrict freedom navigation in the code of conduct, that will be against the Japanese interest. So we are closely watching the, the discussion among the claimants about the code of conduct. And uh, our, our another concern is if some code of conduct uh, which restricts the freedom of navigation or uh, even against the, the, the content of the law of the sea, that might be applied to East China Sea as well. Uh, this is our, maybe the major concern, I think. So this is why uh, we are looking at the South China Sea issue uh, carefully. And these are the basic uh, viewpoints of the Japanese experts. And I have my uh, unique observation on the South China Sea. First of all, uh, I think we have to look at the nuclear dimension of the South China Sea disputes. Of course, the South China Sea is very important as uh, the source of uh, energy and the fishery resources. But um, uh, China is now making a uh, base for its SSBN, the Strategic uh, Ballistic Missile Submarines there. And if uh, China makes South China Sea of limits for its SSBN, uh, you know, kicking out U.S. surveillance forces, that would undermine the the credibility of U.S. extended deterrence over Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and other U.S. friends and allies in Asia. So uh, I'm very much concerned about the this nuclear dimension. And I am proposing to the experts and the government officials in Japan that the Japan needs to consider uh, to join the, the United States to conduct surveillance in the South China Sea to monitor the, uh, the Chinese submarine activities in the South China Sea to uh, maintain the credibi credibility of U.S. extended deterrence. And another thing is uh, uh, <laughs> another thing is uh, you know as although uh, I said that Japan is a neutral country, but uh, in wartime we have to protect our rights as a neutral state. So if Armed um, conflict occurs between the South China Sea uh, claimants, uh, for example, China and the Philippines, or China and the Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnam. Uh, we have to protect our ships in the South China Sea. And what I am proposing to the government is, if anything happens in the South China Sea, I think we have to send our Safety Defense Force to the vicinity of the conflict area to protect the Japanese uh, ships. Uh, so let me conclude with two proposals. One is, uh, actually we have already uh, proposed, uh, but uh, uh, our Prime Minister uh, proposed East Asia Maritime Forum uh, in the East Asia Summit last year to discuss the maritime issues uh, broadly. And as I said, we are concerned about South China Sea as well as the East China Sea. So uh, we need a for former formula to discuss the maritime issues uh, in general in Asia, not only the South China Sea issue, but also the East China Sea 
but probably uh, the Yellow Sea uh, as well. And, and another thing is, this is also uh, this was also proposed by the, the Japanese government uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, the Japanese Defense Ministry proposed uh, ocean peacekeeping in the 1990s. And the basic idea is to share a, a patrol boat by Coast Guard officials from various countries. So we put the Coast Guard officials from uh, regional countries on a single patrol boat so that this ship can patrol the disputed areas. So recent uh, Scarborough uh, conflict, both China and the Philippines send uh, patrol boats and it increased the tension. But if we send a ship uh, with uh, Philippine and the Chinese Coast Guard on the, on the patrol boat, the situation should be different. And in the 1990s, uh, everybody laughed at this idea. It's too much naive. But, uh, but at, at this moment, I think this idea should be pursued under this uh, increased tension. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Katani. Amir, please. Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Murray, for uh, inviting me here today. Um, and uh, just before I begin this afternoon, I just want to say a couple things real quick administratively. I just want to say that um, anything I, I uh, state here today does not represent the views of CSIS, uh, the Defense Department, or the U.S. government. And uh, secondly, as many of you have figured out, I am not the former Indian National Security Advisor, uh, so, nor am I an Indian citizen. Uh, but, but to that end, uh, what I will try to do very briefly uh, in, in the time I have allotted is to sketch out for you some, just some brief thoughts about how India might be looking uh, at the South China Sea. Um, and also by extension, what India's interests are in the South China Sea and how it views the U.S. role there. Now, just to kind of baseline the discussion a little bit, um, you know, I spoke at this uh, South China Sea conference last year about India's views, and I reviewed my notes from that particular conference and, and what I had said. And uh, a lot of what I had said at that time, I think, still applies today, one year later. But I think um, what's happened is that the landscape in the South China Sea for India has been altered just a little bit. Um, by some events that have happened since that conference uh, here at CSIS last year. Uh, and so, you know, three specific incidents, which I think those of you who are very keen followers of the uh, South China Sea, of course, just to reiterate or just to, just to kind of mention them here, um, the uh, Indian naval ship Aravat, uh, which was uh, just finishing up a port visit to Vietnam, was uh, supposedly or, or allegedly called out by the PLA Navy. Um, on its uh, way back home uh, to India, on its transit back to India, as it was patrolling off the Vietnamese coast. Um, and so while the foreign ministries of both countries downplayed the incident, it was, you know, just a, another one, another uh, incident that was played up in the Indian media, uh, which always has uh, a tremendous amount of frenzy about any sort of uh, counter-India activity by China. Um, the second um, incident that happened was more recent uh, when uh, the Indian National Oil Company, ONGC, pulled out of blocks 127 and 128. Um, and so, you know, allegedly this happened, well, this actually happened after the uh, in Chinese had demarched the Indians. But the, um, the, the full backstory, I guess, is a little bit more um, complicated than that, and that ONGC and the Indian government said that, you know, we were on our way out anyway because those blocks of 127 and 128 were not commercially viable. Um, and then um, more recently, uh, over the past, uh, I believe, month and a half, I think, um, there were four Indian ships that had received a 12-hour escort by Chinese naval vessels um, as those ships transited on their way to Shanghai uh, for a naval engagement with the Chinese Navy. Um, so each of these incidents taken individually, I, I don't think is, uh, you know, I would not classify as a significant uh, engagement or any sort of a, 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 a sort of a, an incident with between the Indians and the Chinese, but taken together, they represent additional data points of how China has viewed India's engagement in the South China Sea 
um, dating back to 2000, when the Chinese had expressed objections to India's um, uh, presence in the South China Sea when it tried to conduct exercises at that time. Now, when we look at um, India's interests in the South China Sea, I think we all know that India has had a long interest of engagement with this region dating back to uh, 400 AD uh, when merchant ships uh, were going from India over to China to engage in trade and even as uh, dating back to the Chola Kingdom of the 1100s. Um, fast forward to today, uh, when you look at the trade linkages between India and Southeast Asia and East Asia, um, you're struck by how quickly they have grown um, over the past decade. Um, today, uh, nearly 50 percent of India's trade transits through the South China Sea to destinations in Southeast and East Asia. Um, and when you look at the trade volumes that India has with ASEAN, um, you know, in 1990, you were looking at trade volumes of about $2.4 billion. Um, in 2008-2009, you had $44.6 billion in trade, and then the aspirational goal is to get to $70 billion by either late this year or next year. Um, and then, of course, that's not to mention the free trade agreement that was signed in 2009. That was a key milestone. So for India, um, the South China Sea um, is increasingly becoming linked to its economic well-being, and so it becomes a, a, a key economic interest for India. Um, secondly, I think that um, India's interests in the South China Sea stem from um, India's desire to see China adhere to international norms uh, in the South China Sea. And this is really a concept that I think hits close to home for, for New Delhi um, because of its outstanding border disputes with China based on, or out in the aftermath of the 1962 war that the two countries had. I think that um, how China uh, acts within the South China Sea, if it's willing to um, engage in some sort of an international or in, a, in some sort of a resolution of the South China Sea based on international law, um, it will be very reassuring to the Indians as it tries to resolve its border disputes with China uh, along the Sino-Indian border. Um, increasingly aggressive Chinese behavior, I think, in the South China Sea may have, um, you know, in New Delhi will be interpreted as potentially negative as, uh, you know, the Indians and the Chinese try and resolve their border disputes and especially along the disputed territory of Arunachal Pradesh. So for the Indians, um, they're very interested in, in making sure uh, that China um, adheres to a, uh, an internationally agreed solution. Now, um, when we look at India's approach to the South China Sea, um, to date what we have seen is that the foreign ministry has issued statements about its position that India supports the freedom of navigation uh, in international waters to include the South China Sea in accordance with international law. Um, but beyond that, India has not really articulated any sort of overarching position on the, on the region. Um, but beyond diplomatic statements, when you look at how New Delhi has engaged in this region, they have been very actively engaged in building s um, security partnerships throughout the region. So to date, um, we have seen mill-to-mill -mill engagements with Vietnam, uh, with Singapore, uh, with Japan, and more recently um, with South Korea. Um, now, much of the defense engagements that the Indians have been engaged in are um, focused on port visits, high-level defense dialogues, and some nascent capacity building. Um, and then, of course, uh, what's notable is, of course, the trilateral engagement between the United States, Japan, and India, um, which is uh, dating back to 2007, become deeper and deeper with the Asia dialogue that the three countries engage in, as well as naval exercises that have been taking place um, on a biannual or, or every other year uh, since 2007, with the exception of 2011 um, after the Japanese earthquake. Um, so while India has been um, seemingly active in East Asia and Southeast Asia, though, I think what's important to note is that it's been very um, careful to calibrate its engagement in the region um, and to not become overly pro provocative vis-a-vis uh, -vis its relationship with Beijing. So, um, you know, for, for India, of course, this is rooted in practical considerations that um, while the Chinese have been obstinate in resolving the Sino-Indian border disputes, have become um, a bit more 
uh, cantankerous in their behavior along the Sino-Indian border, they still have to balance that against a trade relationship with China that is now India's biggest trade relationship with anyone. Um, and so, you know, for the for the Indians, it is a, a it is a balancing act between um, standing up to what they see as Chinese provocations and at the same time calibrating it to not become overly provocative um, to Beijing. Um, now, when we look at how India views the the American involvement in the South China Sea, I think that um, uh, New Delhi very closely watches um, U.S.-China relations, and uh, they are very supportive, I think, um, of U.S. efforts to hold the Chinese accountable for their behavior in the South China Sea. And so two years ago, after Secretary Clinton, Secretary Clinton's behavior, or Secretary Clinton's statements at the uh, ASEAN um, uh, Regional Forum, I believe, uh, the Indians had expressed uh, support for those statements. Um, and so the Indians appreciate that Washington takes a firm line and holds the line with Beijing. But at the same time, they don't want to have an overly um, contentious relationship between Washington and New Delhi uh, that may spill over into conflict between the two. So balance becomes the watchword for India. Now, um, when looking at how the U.S. and India might cooperate more on the South China Sea issue, I think that um, up till now there's actually been pretty good coordination between the two. Um, you've got the U.S.-India uh, Asia Dialogue, uh, which has been chaired by Kurt Campbell, um, which you know has a, a is, is a broad dialogue looking at uh, all of the issues in Asia. Um, and so, you know, dialoguing about the South China Sea, I think, is one thing that the U.S. and China could be doing um, and, and are doing. But beyond that, um, <clears throat> perhaps maybe some multilateral maritime activity um, in which the U.S. and India perhaps maybe build disaster response capabilities throughout the South China Sea region to include uh, and bring in China as well. Um, could be one area where you could perhaps maybe build confidence among the major powers in the region. Um, you know, to that end, when we think about uh, U.S.-India collaboration, one of the things that uh, I think is of concern to New Delhi is not to have too much engagement with the United States, I think, in the South China Sea, um, because, of course, that could be a bit provocative for Beijing. And so to the extent that um, the U.S. can support Indian initiatives where India is out in front or these are Asian-led initiatives of multilateral maritime security, um, I think that that would be something that New Delhi would be more comfortable with and I think that, that Washington can get behind. Um, let me just uh, end it on that note and um, look forward to the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Amir. Ambassador Roy. Uh, thank you, Murray. This is the third or fourth or fifth, second? <laughs> no, I've gone to some Southeast, uh, South China like Sea fun. conferences that weren't uh, hosted by uh, uh, CSIS. But I've been to so many, uh, both this year and last year, that I have been reluctantly forced to conclude that this must be an issue. Uh, <laughs> This has already been exhaustively discussed, and I think it's useful to look at the issue in a, in a larger context, because I, I sometimes suspect it was created by political scientist professors, because it, it really brings together so many issues in international relations that are complex and difficult to manage. Uh, it brings together the issue of U.S.-China competition caused by the rise of China uh, and the historic traditional U.S. presence as a security factor in the Western Pacific. Uh, so there's that element there. But it also heavily involves ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries, in both helpful and unhelpful ways because only four of the ASEAN members are involved in disputed claims in the South China Sea. And that means that the Southeast Asian countries that have been remarkably effective at forging an ability to work together on common issues don't have common interests in the South China Sea. 
They have some common interests in the sense of favoring peace and stability, but they don't have common interests in terms of how far risks should be taken in pursuing national claims. So there's that complication. There's the third complication, of course, which is that other parties, as we heard from our uh, Japanese colleague here, uh, have very fundamental issues in the South China Sea. A third of the world's trade uh, shipping moves through the South China Sea. And for centuries, it has been essentially a, uh, uh, an international waterway that was not under the administrative jurisdiction of any particular country. So in other words, countries have centuries of traditions of using the waters of the South China Sea for un unrestricted trade purposes. But it also involves the question of relations among so-called great powers and significant but lesser powers. And history has taught us that often wars are caused by the relations between great powers being pulled into disputes among lesser powers. Uh, you will recall that World War I began in the Balkans uh, uh, and then spread to involve the, the large powers of Europe. So there is the potential in the South China Sea issue to have disputes among smaller countries pursuing their particular territorial claims in ways that then bring in the interests of large countries, which takes it out of the hands of the smaller countries and may get them involved in conflicts that they had no interest in getting involved in originally. So th this has many different implications that we need to uh, think about. Uh, somebody commented on the fact that people want the United States to somehow take responsibility for China's behavior in the South China Sea. It's a very interesting concept, and I suspect the Chinese would have their own views on the subject. But it also raises the question, should the United States be responsible for the behavior of Southeast Asian countries in the South China Sea? After all, uh, Southeast Asian countries are just as capable of being provocative as China is capable of being provocative. So if the United States doesn't want provocative behavior, uh, should it be responsible for trying to suppress provocative behavior? I have a feeling the Southeast Asians would have their own views on that subject. But it turns out that many people who think about this question want the United States to be involved in ways that support their position, but not involved in ways that might impact on their own positions. So that one has to think about what are the principles that ought to lie behind uh, the U.S. involvement in this. Now, this has been kind of a low-key issue for many, many years. Uh, people knew their, the, the disputed claims began to emerge uh, several decades ago, and there was speculation about the resources that existed in the South China Sea and that uh, could fuel uh, the interests of countries in making claims in the region, but not very much happened and we had a period of tension in the 1990s, and then there was some very effective diplomacy at the beginning of the last decade, and we ended up with the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea, and we ended up with the China-ASEAN Strategic Partnership, and everything looked like sweetness and light, and now all of a sudden, not only do we have tensions rising again in the region, but the United States has declared that it has fundamental interests in the South China Sea, in the sense of a freedom of navigation, and China has welcomed our involvement the same way the Canadians welcomed the involvement of de Gaulle in handling the Quebec problem they were facing. Uh, so in other words, the issue has become both more tense and more complicated. And it doesn't just involve oil and gas, it involves fishing activities, which have been fundamental to the economies of many of the regional countries uh, in disputed waters. And this has been a factor in the Scarborough uh, Scholl's case, as we have already seen. Now, we need to bear in mind some of the background on this, because for most of modern history, uh, most of the surrounding countries were under colonial regimes, and all of the claimants to disputed territories in the South China Sea were under colonial regimes. 
And this only ended in the period from 1946 until 1984, when Brunei got its independence, uh, so that the ability of sovereign states in the region to put forward claims is a very recent development. But the history of the region goes way back. Uh, my colleague, uh, 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 Mr. Latif, referred to the fact that India was involved back in 400 AD. And when we look at the history of the region, we discovered that the various countries involved, in some cases, have very detailed historical records going back millennia. And in other cases, they have almost no historical records going back a period. So how do you handle claims which are partly based on proximity and partly based on a long history taught in schools over centuries of involvement in a region which other countries now are claiming uh, rights in because of the fact that they are close to the region uh, but don't have the detailed historical records to back up their positions. So this makes the issue very uh, difficult uh, to handle. The United States is in an anomalous position in coming into this question. It takes no position on the various claims to sovereignty in the region, and we've made that position claim uh, true in every case. We have a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines, which applies in the event of an armed attack in the Pacific area on either of the parties, including attacks on their armed forces, public vessels, or aircraft in the Pacific. So the question of whether or not we recognize the Philippine claim to say Scarborough Shoal is really irrelevant because the defense treaty applies if there's an attack on Philippine ships. And so therefore the United States can't involve being dragged in in some fashion there. But what responsibilities that give off if we don't want to be dragged into an armed clash in terms of monitoring Philippine behavior? with respect to its own sovereign claims in the region. This is a very complicated issue, and it's not one that puts the United States in an easy position. Now, we have made our position uh, clear and consistent. Uh, every country, when it announces its position, of course, makes it claim that it's clear and consistent. We call for restraint and diplomatic resolution. We oppose provocation. We oppose coercion. We oppose the use of force. We do not take sides on competing territorial claims, and we want disputes to be resolved peacefully and in a manner consistent with international law. Now, that's a very nice statement, and that comes from the statement by Secretary of Defense Panetta at the uh, Shangri-La conference uh, a short while ago in Singapore. So some of you may be familiar with it. But the United States has not ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the most basic fundamental law applying to the region. So we're calling for adherence to a rule of law, which we have failed to ratify, and this puts us in a somewhat anomalous position in terms of our moral authority on these questions. Additionally, and the Law of the Sea doesn't entirely clarify this, and as was referred to earlier, the United States and China basically disagree on uh, what are the permissible activities within the exclusive economic zones. Uh, and that's a problem which is going to constantly plague our ability to uh, work out satisfactory arrangements. Now, let's go back to the Declaration on Code of Conduct, because we need to be specific. This was not simply a US-China joint communique which many people forget were never signed. But the Declaration on the Code of Conduct was signed by all of the parties, China and the 10 um, uh, ASEAN countries. And in it, they reaffirmed their respect for and commitment to the freedom of navigation in and over flight above the South China Sea. They undertook to resolve their territorial and jurisdictional disputes by peaceful means without resorting to the threat or use of force through friendly consultations and negotiations. They undertook to exercise self-restraint in the conduct of activities that would complicate or escalate disputes and affect peace and stability. They agreed to work on the basis of consensus for the adoption of a code of conduct in the South China Sea. Now, I, every night when I go to bed, before I go to sleep, I read this declaration <laughs> on the code of conduct. 
and convince myself that there can't possibly be any dispute in the South China Sea if the parties to this declaration were adhering to the language that they formally signed off on. So clearly something's wrong. Parties are adhering to principles that they are not applying in their behavior patterns. And this is not simply a Chinese problem, it's a problem of all of the parties who signed off on the declaration to some form. So when I wake up in the morning, I suddenly realize that it was all a dream, that in fact, <laughs> that in fact there is a problem out here, and the problem is rooted in the behavior of countries that on the one hand have very friendly and expansive relations with each other. After all, China is the principal trading partner of most of the disputants out there, including J Japan, and uh, its trade with India is growing. Uh, it's still far below the realm of others, but with South Korea and with Taiwan and with uh, some of the countries of Southeast Asia, and all of them want friendly relations with China, and China's eco economic growth is the engine of growth in the region, so nobody wants to have these relationships destroyed. And yet countries are motivated by their narrow interests in the South China Sea, so their behavior patterns don't adhere to the documents that they themselves have signed and are creating tension where they have agreed to not create tension. And they're engaging in provocative behavior. You can, re you can point to Sinook's recent action, but Vietnam has been drilling in disputed waters for uh, decades. Uh, this issue arose when I was in China and China was very upset that a U.S. company had taken on a drilling contract uh, for Vietnam. Uh, and the Philippines has been talking about going ahead uh, in, the, uh, um, in the Reed Bank with some exploratory activities. So in other words, there are all sorts of potential out here for this issue getting out of control. Now, the United States can't stay uninvolved in this because we have an enormous interest in freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. And it's not only for the trade factors that go through there, but, but our military vessels regularly pass through the South China Sea en route to the Indian Ocean and Diego Garcia and other areas. And Japan has its own interests down in the region there. So this is not something we can not touch. But there's an element in the U.S. position that is not clear. And let me just touch on this, because we are talking, and Secretary Panetta was very outspoken in talking about it at the Shangri-La Dialogue, in saying that we were going to increase our military presence in the region and we were going to seek greater access. The media gets it wrong. They talk about we're trying to restore our bases. Uh, my understanding is that there's no possibility of the United States restoring bases in the region. Uh, none of the countries there wants a U.S. base. Uh, but just the way Chinese ships engaging in anti-piracy operations in, uh, in the Gulf of Aden need access to shore facilities, so U.S. ships in the region are going to need access to shore facilities, and it's therefore natural the United States would want to increase our access. But we're creating expectations. And what is the U.S. purpose? Now let's look at some concrete possibilities. Let's say there's an armed clash, God forbid, between China and Philippine naval vessels. Well, the United States can't be not involved in that because of our mutual defense treaty. It doesn't matter whether it occurs in Scarborough Shoals or whether it occurs off Hawaii. The defense treaty refers to Pacific, so it's a big area. But what if Vietnam and China get into armed clashes? Does the United States have a responsibility? What's a U.S. warship going to do under those circumstances? Or what if it's between you know, Malaysia and Vietnam? What use is a U.S. military vessel in the South China Sea in clashes over sovereign claims that are in conflict between countries where the United States has no formal defense responsibilities? So we're creating an expectation that somehow our presence is going to stabilize the situation, but what if it doesn't? Then if the United States doesn't act when crises occur, it looks as though we're not reliable, but in fact we have no obligation to behave, and we haven't clarified this question. So we're increasing a military presence in an area without a clear understanding of what the purpose of those forces is and what the activities of the United States will be. Now this is potentially dangerous. 
Now, sometimes it's dangerous to clarify what you intend to do, uh, where creative ambiguity may be better. And sometimes creative ambiguity leads to misunderstanding. So this is the reason why this issue is so complex and why the language used in the Declaration on the Code of Conduct is so important. Because it really does require all parties not simply to sign this type of declaration, but to actually act in ways that are consistent with the declaration, or else it doesn't matter how powerful the United States is, it's not going to be able to use its presence in the region in a way that will contribute to the peace and stability that is in the interest of all the other countries there. So that's why this issue needs to be studied in political science classes and, uh, and by foreign ministries, because there's enormous complexity here, and trying to look at it narrowly through the viewpoint of the interests of any particular country is simply not going to be helpful in trying to find a way that can achieve the collective interest of all of the countries in not letting this issue interfere with their broader relations. So I think there is an enormous possibility for things to go wrong in the South China Sea, and there are enormous possibilities for things to be handled in ways that damp down tensions and don't let this issue interfere with the more fundamental interests of all of the countries involved in this issue, because it's hard to come up with a single scenario that would be beneficial to any of the claimants if it were to result in actual conflict in the region. So I think the United States can play a constructive role, but it has to be very careful that it does not create expectations that we can do things which we're not in a position to do and that could make matters worse because of the great power factors that I mentioned at the beginning of our remarks. Let me end on that point. Ambassador Roy has to leave a little bit early. So if your question is for Ambassador, maybe we should... Uh Thank you, Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency. Uh, my question is for Ambassador Roy. You mentioned that the South China Sea issue actually is a low-key issue for many, many years. And last year, I remember uh, when uh, Assistant Secretary Campbell came to CSIS to have a speech there, I raised the same question, and he said uh, the South China Sea issue it actually has been existing for a long time. It's not a new issue. But the problem is why this issue right now is so hot. From your view, from your perspective, what's the reason behind this? And right now, now that the, the water has been stirred, how, what's the most important step or measure to be taken uh, for the involved party to calm down the, the stirred water? Thank you. It's, it's a good question. Uh, from the beginning, the potential for the low-key disputes was recognized in the possible resources that existed in the South China Sea. In more recent years, the resources have turned out to be real. Uh, there have been successful operations extracting oil and gas from the South China Sea, and therefore, the economic interests of the various countries involved have become more acute. So I think that the most basic factor is that the self-interest of countries in being sure that they have access to the oil and gas resources in the South China Sea in areas adjacent to their countries has been the driving factor behind pushing forward their claims and being assertive in trying to establish firm positions on the question. Uh, I, I would cite that as the most important factor. Now, this is an area where the United States is also in an awkward position. For example, China has put forward this concept of setting aside disputes and ha engaging in uh, joint development. What's the U.S. position on that? 
Do we favor joint development? Are we prepared to use our influence with the Philippines or with Vietnam or with uh, Brunei, which I think has a joint development uh, understanding with, uh, with China, or with Malaysia? Actually, we don't take a position on that. But how are we going to be involved in this issue if there's one proposal that might be a satisfactory way of handling it, but the United States doesn't know what its position is on that question? This just gets back to the point I made, which is the United States has clarified some of its approach, but there are el other elements it hasn't yet clarified, and that this um, has some potential problems associated with it. Um, uh, I'm Ron Percival, I'm with uh, CNA. Uh, Mr. Kotani, I really wanted to talk to you about some of this. Supposedly on, hello? Uh, Mr. Kotani, I'd really like to talk a little bit about Japan's policy in the South China Sea, if I could. Historically, Japan's been very diffident about using either the Coast Guard or the Maritime Self-Defense Forces in Southeast Asia. Um, particularly the Coast, uh, the only thing they used in anti-piracy was the Coast Guard, and Southeast Asians were very much holding Japan at arm's length. You've talked about using Maritime Self-Defense Forces down in the South China Sea, and a proposal you're going to make about actually having Japanese survey, military survey ships go in and back up the American ideas about uh, rights in the EEZ. Is this your thinking, or is this actually uh, uh, Japanese thinking? Is there any part of the Japanese government who agrees with you? Uh, this is my idea, but uh, I discussed this issue uh, with some of the government officials and uh, uh, academics and U.S. military. Well, we, we are discussing the joint patrol of the South China Sea. Uh, thank you. I want to ask Mr. Kotani and Mr. Latif, in view of your interest in shipping and so forth, is Japan and India also preparing itself to get involved in security and possibly military activities in the South China Sea. Thank you. Uh, I, I think from an Indian perspective, uh, I, I would say that the answer is no. Um, I think that um, from, a, from a, an Indian perspective, they see um, the relationship with Japan and the exercises with Japan and the United States as ways to develop their own naval capabilities. But I, you know, if I was a, a serving Indian official sitting up here, I mean, I would say, and, and my own assessment of this is that I don't think that this is aimed at preparation for any sort of military action uh, in the South China Sea from an Indian perspective. Um, as I said in my presentation, uh, if armed conflict occurs in South China Sea, and if we have to protect our ships as a neutral state, um, I think the, the Japanese government needs to think about it. And but otherwise, uh, we would be kind of uh, you know benign uh, partner with the South China Sea countries. My my question is addressed to uh, Ambassador uh, Roy Appleton. I have to thank you very much for your presentation, which is at times entertaining, but very extremely clear and thoughtful. My question is this, I have heard from the morning talk about how to manage the conflict in South China Sea. We talk about the rule-based uh, conduct. We talk about code of conduct, but I haven't heard 
about any kind of stability and peace that is based on some kind of appropriate balance of power, or appropriate uh, security structures. Do you have any thought on that? Thank you. Your question relates to whether we have thoughts on a, an appropriate security structure for the South China Sea uh, region in order to contain the possibility for conflicts. Uh, there are a variety of mechanisms now for trying to address these questions, uh, both within ASEAN itself, uh, through the ASEAN dialogues with various other parties, through the ASEAN Regional Forum, which takes into account uh, these questions, through the meeting of the ASEAN and partner defense ministers that has now uh, been institutionalized and is a very helpful development, through the East Asia Summit, where all of the relevant parties are represented uh, at the table. Uh, I have not seen any concrete proposals for a uh, a formal security structure for the region. Uh, it's an idea that would have to be um, uh, developed, discussed, and we would have to see how different countries felt about such an arrangement. So I don't, be I don't begin from a position of being either for it or against it. I am for measures that can help to preserve peace and stability in the region because I think U.S. interests and I think the interests of the countries in the region would be greatly served by a continuation of the peace and stability which has enabled their economic growth to be so dramatically successful. But uh, you've raised an interesting idea, but I do not have a, uh, a, a concrete response to you. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Ambassador and a question for Tesro. Uh, Ambassador Roy mentioned uh, that not only China um, committed a lot of uh, provocative, uh, provocative activity, but also South Asian countries. But uh, how to measure what action are provocative? And second, uh, you mentioned that Vietnam are just um, Chinook. Uh, or, uh, just recently announced an uh, uh, international bidding for uh, oil and gas block in the disputed area, and you blame Vietnam for a long time uh, drilling in the disputed area. But my question is, uh, uh, where is the disputed area in the South China Sea? Because from uh, my point of view, disputed area is perchance partly and some land feature, and they are surrounding waters. Uh, according to Anglos. But what Vietnam doing is within Vietnam is easy. It's similar to Chinese, uh, China drilling, drill in India easy from Hainan and, and uh, mainland. Not much different. And uh, my question to uh, Tesla, you mentioned that uh, uh, in Vietnam new law of the sea, there was uh, a serious article on um, innocent passage of uh, military vessels through in internal um, territory waters, uh, which require a prior notification, and you says it's violation of UNCLOS. Could you elaborate more what is provision in UNCLOS prohibit the country to request prior notification before uh, committed innocent passes? Because prior notification is not uh, authorization. And it's just for uh, maintain freedom of navigation and to avoid misunderstanding between military vessels from different countries. Thank you. Uh, let me briefly uh, answer your question, and then I unfortunately have to leave. Uh, I'm no longer a diplomat. I'm a retired diplomat. Uh, but one of the de definitions of a diplomat is someone who never inadvertently insults somebody. Uh, in other words, the essence of diplomacy is understanding how your behavior will be seen by the other party. So 
effective international relations depends on whether governments are skillful in understanding what constitutes provocative behavior. If they fail to understand it, or if they are so single-minded that they always see the other person as the provocative party and never understand when their behavior is provocative to the other party, then international relations can't function uh, properly. Uh, I suspect that all of the parties in the South China Sea know when they're being provocative, but they are provocative because they have interests that they feel it necessary to defend. Uh, and if that process is allowed to get out of control, then you have a spiraling crisis, uh, which is why you need to rein in such behavior. Uh, the problem is, uh, and I just recently visited both China and the Philippines back to back, and I heard very different stories about who was being provocative. Uh, and there was even some people, I won't say whom, who thought that the United States was deliberately stirring up the provocations because we somehow were going to benefit from a lack of peace and stability in the South China Sea, which I find totally baffling. But believe it or not, some people think that way. So uh, my answer to your question is, I think, the, I think parties know when they're being provocative, uh, but there are other factors that lie behind it. And uh, I think when, when wiser heads come into play, they recognize that toning down the provocative behavior is better. Now, one of the good aspects, for example, which hasn't been addressed in our comments here, is the fact that, for example, in the Scarborough um, uh, Shoals case, um, we weren't seeing the military vessels getting directly involved. Uh, in China's case, they're using the Ministry of Agriculture Fisheries uh, 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 protection ships and the state oceanic administration's uh, patrol ships. And as in the case of the Senkaku Diaoyutai uh, problem with Japan, where you've had Coast Guard vessels, et cetera, rather than having uh, naval vessels involved, that's a good way of trying to keep the provocations from becoming too direct. Uh, so I still have hopes that the various parties involved will recognize that they need to curb prov potentially provocative behavior, however justified, in the interests of not letting the situation uh, worsen and get out of control. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, the if a country can require prior notification for the innocent passage on the foreign uh, vessels. Um, for example, this this country can utilize this um, for uh, increase the claims over certain territory. For example, this is this may not be a good example, but for example, if China uh, says the foreign warships uh, needs to uh, make a prior notification through the uh, through the territorial uh, waters and China applies this formula to Senkaku. Uh, this will cause a problem for Japan. And uh, you know, if we didn't not notify our warships passing through the Senkaku territory waters, China can claim that the, uh, Japan uh, violated the, the Chinese law or something like that. So, uh, so if we allow such a prior notification or prior approval uh, clauses, that will be uh, used for other purposes as well. So in that sense, I think the, we should uh, stick to the, the current interpretation of the innocent passage that uh, as long as we uh, uh, respect the security of the coastal state, the, the warships should be uh, allowed to pass through the territory waters without any uh, notification. My question, my question is to Mr. Latif. I'm happy to hear that you said uh, Japan uh, would take no side to the South China Sea issue. 
But however, you just mentioned that uh, 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 Japan would like to join the United States to monitor uh, Chinese submarine activities. So may I say that uh, uh, taking no side on the South China Sea issue is just uh, your diplomatic language. Uh, but to get involved in the South China Sea is uh, a Japanese real policy. Given that uh, during the standoff between China and the Philippines of the uh, Huangyang Island, uh, the Japanese government announced that Japan will sell or donate several warships to the Philippines. Do you think it's, for, it's helpful to the peace and the stability in the South China Sea? Thank you. You know, we an we yeah, we announced the you know we will provide a ten not warships. We will provide patrol boats to the Philippine Coast Guard in the coming years. Uh, but this is not to provoke uh, other countries. And this was actually uh, basically discussed uh, last year, not after the Scarborough uh, conflict uh, confrontation. And our intention is to provide uh, capacity and, and capabilities to the South China Sea countries so that they can maintain maritime order in the South China Sea. Uh, and uh, unless, I mean, as long as their c capacity is, is insufficient, uh, there may be a, you know, uh, cases that the Japan needs to send our own ships to protect our own ships. Uh, but uh, our basic uh, stance is to provide capacity for other countries they, so that they can uh, maintain the order by themselves. Thank you. I'm Jay Park, a visiting fellow at the CSIS. Uh, maybe a question for uh, Mr. Kutani. Uh, regarding the uh, um, issue of uh, freedom of navigation, I think there, has, uh, there seems to have been a consensus among non-claimant states that their key interest is not uh, the territorial issues, it's on the uh, merit um, freedom of navigation. But in response to uh, this, the China have maintained uh, I think we have heard from this morning's session that China has, uh, there has never been uh, uh, jeopardized and it is quite stable. Uh, in response to this, again, there is an argument that it's not about the actual threat or actual violation. It's about the fears or concerns uh, which uh, merchant ship can feel or the people who are passing by this uh, sea can feel in the near future. I wonder, uh, how do you think about uh, those arguments? Yes, I discussed this, I this issue with Chinese uh, friends. And, but you know, Chinese people don't use the term freedom navigation. They use the term free passage uh, into the, in the South China Sea. And, and what they mean by free passage is actually the innocent passage. They don't uh, th they say the foreign ships should uh, conduct f uh, innocent passage in Chinese EEZ and Chinese uh, Nine Dash Line, but you know innocent passage is not uh, it's not free. There's a restriction on the navigation. So obviously there's a, a difference uh, among the uh, Chinese and other countries' interpretation of the freedom of navigation. This is uh, actually this question I was planning to the ambassador, Ambassador Roy, but he's not here, so um, I just present it as a comment. So, uh, the ambassador was talking about the role of U United States and a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, however, I think that uh, the thinking of the ambassador might be, um, uh, has a little uh, flaw that a lot of people might, might fall into that uh, 
the ambassador was talking about the, uh, the uh, dispute among the little nation that will pull large power into the case. But this it have a one superpower in one one side, and the other side is the l uh, number of little nation, and that is where the problem is. Because if we have something to balance the other superpower, then we have peace and stability. But when you have a one side, very strong and powerful, uh, China is the number one, number two economy of the world today, very powerful and a little number of little guy, and obviously for the last decade also we can see that uh, uh, China exert its superpower status in South China Sea, and so that 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 is the reality that we need to grasp in order to figure out how to deal with that, because. If the United States say we're nu neutral, everybody say that we're neutral, uh, that China will continue to exert itself. Uh, and that it from the little country like Vietnam, that is a serious threat. Well, I mean, I, I would just say that, you know, uh, from, from New Delhi's perspective, I mean, I think, you know, my observation has been is that um, the, the Southeast Asian and East Asian countries really would love to see more Indian engagement in, in, in Southeast Asia and East Asia. Um, uh, but I think that, um, you know, putting Chinese sensitivities aside, there's some other limiting factors in India which are preventing it from perhaps maybe taking a more uh, assertive leadership role in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and in Asia in general. And, and I mean, there's a couple of issues. Number one, there's a capacity issue, I think, in, in, in the Indian government. Um, not just uh, a capacity issue within their bureaucracy, but also a capacity issue with their military as well. Um, you're looking at a Navy that's a 55,000-man Navy. Uh, they're in the process of trying to recapitalize their Navy and trying to add additional capability. And so, um, you know, when you look at India's uh, ability, their capacity, both from a bureaucratic standpoint as well as a military standpoint, there's, there's only so much that they're going to be able to do. The other um, factor that I put out there is, you know, within India, I mean, given the, um, the democratic process in India, uh, I mean, currently what you have right now is a government that's mired in political paralysis. There's, um, there's a lack of decisive leadership within New Delhi. And so um, the, the political process is decidedly focused inward towards a number of these domestic scandals um, that have really kind of consumed the day-to-day -day operations of the government. And so they have not really, um, uh, you know, put forth a lot of intellectual capital towards thinking about what is India's position in the larger uh, Indo-Pacific realm. And I'm not sure that it's going to get any better anytime soon, because when you look at the political dynamics currently inside of India, you're looking at a situation where regional parties who have very parochial interests could become increasingly influential. And it's unclear as to what their foreign policy orientation is or what their thinking is about these, these sorts of matters. So, um, you know, while I think that Asia would love to see India take a more uh, active role within ASEAN forums as well as more generally, I think that um, New Delhi, the, the, the forecast that I would put out there is that New Delhi will continue to engage um, the South China Sea and Southeast Asia on kind of like a case-by-case -case basis. And that's, that's, I think, the best we could probably hope for in the near to midterm. Okay, I would like to um, thank our panelists. Uh, and please join me in giving them a hand for their uh, participation.